Well, let's begin then with uh, Veterans Day Memorial <laughs> Call to Worship. If you look to uh, the bulletin, please follow me. On this day of memory, we gather to sing and to pray. We remember the past and look to the future. On this day, when the guns once fell silent, we come before you, God, seeking your peace. On this day of hope, in the face of terror, we come before you, God, praying with all our hearts. God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Help us to find the path that leads to the peaceable kingdom. Open our eyes and the eyes of the nations to find a different path through the disagreements of life in this world. In this time of story, song, and prayer, may we be recommitted to being people of peace, true peace. May we catch a vision of how the world could live together. And so we echo the old prayers, make us channels of your peace. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with us. Amen. And now please turn to hymn number 39. We'll sing, O God, our help in ages past. The version of that I have is a really nice rendition by a Mennonite a cappella choir. So let's sing along with them. To the bulletin and read with me this morning's corporate prayer. God of life, in this time of prayer and song and memory, awaken us to your life-giving presence. May that sense of your spirit within and among us 
Empower us to be people of peace, true peace. Help us remember that true peace comes not from victory on the battlefield, but through justice and abundant life for all people of the world. This we pray in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who was called the Prince of Peace. Amen. Now please take a moment to greet one another in Christian love and fellowship. The first scripture this morning comes from the Psalter, from Psalm 30. Please uh, look to your Bible and uh, as we read. Hear the word of the Lord. I will exalt you, O Lord. For you lifted me out of the depths, and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken, O Lord, when you favored me. You made my mountain stand firm, but when you hid your face, I was dismayed. For you, O Lord, I called, to the Lord I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. And now we'll sing a great old hymn uh, based on that. It's uh, number 288 in the hymnal. Do not have the words on the screen. Uh, this is just piano accompaniment that I could find for it. So, uh, out of the depths to the glory above, number 288. Thank you. 
that was hard. Had trouble finding accompaniment to that. We don't sing that much anymore. Uh, thanks for sharing that with me. We pray that prayer that we call yours the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's gospel lesson comes from the fifth chapter of Matthew. A um, large part of what is often known as the Sermon on the Mount. But we're going to begin with um, verse 13. So hear the word of the Lord. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, Anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the word of the Lord, for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, 
I've been saying for several months now that the Christian church in our <laughs> culture has been compromising the foundations of our faith. Too many of us have been cherry-picking the scriptures, believing and obeying the parts that we like or that seem acceptable to everyone, while we often ignore or conveniently omit the parts that are controversial or don't sound so nice. Like the parts that talk about hell, for instance. As I've said before, many people question Christians these days and very often we just don't have good answers for them. Perhaps you've heard this question. How can a God of love send anyone to hell? That's a tough one, isn't it? How would you answer it? Have you thought about that? Think about it for a bit. We'll address that question shortly. But first I want to address another issue, which is our sin of omission. And that is not telling people the truth about hell. Now, I'm partly to blame for that, just like anyone else. I have not preached about hell since I've been here, uh, since I've been in the ministry. I'm sure I've mentioned it in some scripture readings and in passing, but I haven't made a point about what a serious issue it is. And I guess all I can say about that now is, my bad, Father, please forgive me. Because thinking about it, I came to the realization that at some point in my life, I practically stopped believing in hell. You know, I was too smart to believe in hell, I thought. But that is no longer true. I do believe in hell. But like so many Christians and even church leaders today, I basically bought into the lie that I could serve the God of the Bible, but not necessarily believe or follow the entire Bible. I found out, though, that the more that I read the Bible, the more that I study the Word of God, the more and more I am hearing him tell me that all of it is true. And if we don't include and accept the hairy parts, then we can't expect to receive the lovely parts. And over and over again throughout the Bible, we are warned that church leaders especially must hold to the deep truths of the faith. And hell is one of those deep truths. But it's just so damn unpleasant and unpopular, isn't it? See, Paul pleaded in his final words to Timothy to preach the word, every last bit of it, regardless of how unpopular it became. And I'm pretty sure that exhortation still stands. So, I decided to talk about hell. And once I really started to look into it, I realized that there is so much information and so much has been and can be said about the topic of hell that it will be difficult to just scratch the surface. So I decided to scratch the surface. We'll probably talk about it this week, maybe next week. We'll see how it goes. And we'll actually refer to it coming up again in upcoming weeks when we look into the second coming and the end times. And hell is not a topic that most Christians like to address. I mean, why talk about hell when you can talk about something much more positive, like heaven, or living a good life? Well, Jesus talked about it. A lot. And I wonder, when was the last time that you heard a sermon about hell? Honestly, I can't remember when I did the last time. What about the last time you heard somebody mention hell? Well, that's not very often anymore either. 
I remember being involved with a Christmas musical at a church a few years ago before I was preparing to be in the ministry. And while watching a rehearsal to prepare for the angel dance that comes right before the nativity, the director said, we need to get this right. We need to get this together because there are going to be people that see this show who do not know Jesus. They are going to hell and this might be what saves them. I was surprised to hear that, to hear a Sunday school teacher say that. I was taken aback, actually. The woman had sort of spoken offhand, and yet what she said impacts me to this very day. See, it's so easy to live in our comfortable Christian bubbles without thinking about those who are not saved. They're everywhere. They're all around us. But the truth is, hell is real, and those who do not accept Jesus will spend eternity there. Eternity is a long time. We're all going to be dead much longer than we're alive. How then are we to live our lives as Christians knowing the reality of hell? I mean, hell ought to drive us to share the only hope that we have, the only hope for the whole world, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Because hell is horrible, so it is something that most people don't want to dwell on. We'd rather reflect on God's love, His mercy, and His grace. However, sometimes the most loving, merciful thing we can do is to tell others that there will be consequences for their actions, not only in this life, but in the eternal life to come. And it's a topic that most of us want to avoid. But Jesus didn't avoid it. He talked about hell and judgment more than almost anything else. And we all desperately need to know the truth about hell so we can fully appreciate how wonderful eternal life will be with God, not apart from Him. And most of our knowledge, really, about the reality of hell comes from the lips of Jesus Himself. And if He is God, and He came to us to teach us about eternal realities, then we must take seriously this very difficult subject of hell. His resurrection proves His claims to be God, and therefore we can trust what Jesus tells us. What does Jesus say about hell? It's awful. It's dark. He says, it has fires. He says, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does that mean, by the way, weeping and gnashing of teeth? Well, it's a metaphor. It suggests regret for something one did wrong. So hell is a place where those there will eternally regret what they have done wrong where they will always regret rejecting their Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why he spent so much time talking about it, so that we might realize how serious it is and do whatever we can to avoid it, both for ourselves and for others. In our Gospel lesson, we read from his Sermon on the Mount a message that's often quoted because of its wonderful promises. As we heard, hell is also mentioned in that same sermon. i read that part again. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment, and anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool! will be in danger of the fire of hell. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, 
and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So Jesus said it, and he said it often. Jesus also stressed in that sermon that we should enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. He later warned that we should fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And the religious leaders of his day, of course, were not exempt. To them, speaking, he spoke to them, speaking of their religious hypocrisy, he said, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Hell is also a place of fire, or possibly of some fearful environment that could only be described adequately under the metaphor of fire. In fact, Christ calls it a lake of fire in his revelation to John, where he said, He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give a drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes it will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And there's much more. If I were to read all it says in the Bible about hell, all that Jesus said about hell, then we would be here for quite a while. But we need to know about it, since there is, frankly, nothing more important. Hell will indeed be very real, eternally real. Since Christ is both our Creator and our Savior, who died for our sins and defeated death by his resurrection, it's foolish for anyone to reject his revelation about hell. Which brings us to the questions that people ask. Question. Why does God send people to hell? The Bible says that God created hell for Satan and the wicked angels who rebelled against him. But there are people in hell also, Jesus said. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Both angelic beings and human beings are in hell for the same reason, sin and rebellion against God. Because God is completely righteous and morally perfect, he always does what is right. 
And there is no darkness in God, not the smallest speck of imperfection. God himself is the standard for what is right, what is good, what is moral. If it were not for God being the standard of moral perfection, then created beings would have nothing to measure themselves against. In other words, if God is perfectly righteous, then anything that falls short of that perfection is sinful. And every human being who has ever lived since Adam's fall from grace has committed sin. Because Adam sinned, the entire human race now has a sinful nature. But people do not go to hell because of Adam's sin. They go to hell because of their own sin, which they freely choose. You can read about that in James chapter 1. Jesus himself had an answer for this. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light is come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Some people ask the question this way, what kind of God would condemn people to eternal torment? If you haven't been asked this question yet, you probably will. Um, and it's the weightiest matter that anyone will ever face. Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis answers this question well. And the key is to look at the question from a different angle. What kind of God would not condemn his enemies to an eternal hell? You see, they're asking the wrong question. When someone asks, how can you believe in a God who would condemn people to suffer the torments of hell eternally? I try to reply with a question of my own, how can you believe in a God who would not? Because to ask the first question, is to fundamentally misunderstand the very nature of God. It's to reform him into the image of man. Because here's the thing. If you want a God who is good, truly good, and if you want a God who is just, absolutely just, and holy, then you must have this God this God who condemns people to suffer the eternal torments of hell. You cannot have the God you want unless there is a hell. You cannot have a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and so very good. See, God's goodness doesn't negate eternal punishment in hell. It demands it. It's much the same as saying something like, you really cannot appreciate joy and peace and love unless you've experienced suffering as well. God's word is clear on this matter. The Bible describes hell as a place where God pours out his wrath on people who have been created in his image. And God the Father has appointed his son to be the eternal judge who will condemn people to hell. And this is not momentary or temporary torture dispensed by Satan or his demons, but eternal torment poured out by God himself. And this punishment will be inflicted upon conscious human beings, people who know who they are, what they were, what they have done. And it is truly 
literally impossible to imagine a worse reality than this one, really. And yet, the Bible, the best of books by the best of authors, the perfect book by the most trustworthy of authors, tells us it is so. If this is his judgment, then anything less wouldn't be worthy of an infinitely holy, just, and good God. And who am I to question God? If this infinitely holy and just God declares that hell exists and asserts that hell must exist, then rebellion against his will <clears throat> merely reveals a failure in my own understanding of what justice and goodness really is. I mean, do I know better than God? Or is it possible that I am far worse than God, infinitely worse, and that I fall woefully short of a complete understanding of God's goodness and sin's wickedness? And really, to ask the question in the first place is to answer it. Because asking shows that I am judging God's justice and goodness when I can't even begin to understand it fully in the first place. So, why eternal punishment? The eternal never-ending nature of the sinner's punishment is directly related to the infinite and eternal nature of God. When you sin against an infinite God, then he's always sinned against. And all sin is primarily oriented toward God, and so you accrue an infinite debt. And this is the only way to explain the Father's decision not to spare his Son but to deliver him to suffer in our place. An eternal, infinite being, Jesus Christ, was needed to bear the weight of an infinite punishment. And he did. But why torment? Well, the torments of hell are directly related to the perfect holiness of God. Those who face that weight of condemnation have sinned against a God who is truly, purely holy. God's holiness is unable to tolerate anything or anyone that is unholy. His holiness is like a gag reflex that acts out in wrath against all sin. So that on the cross, even Christ had to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was cut off from all that was good and pure and holy. In our place, he paid the price. Well, why conscious torment? Those who have sinned consciously must also bear their punishment consciously. The Bible tells us that we have not been passive in our rebellion against God, but we've been willing participants, active rebels. Justice demands conscious punishment, not mere annihilation of the person or his or her sin. And what clearer example do we have than Jesus Christ, who consciously bore God's wrath against sin? If Christ's suffering for our sin was conscious, so too will be the suffering of those who bear their own sin. God will not ask less of them than he asked of his son. But he willingly accepted your punishment because he loves you. Just accept him. I heard this question asked uh, of Billy Graham, and I'll kind of finish with this, because I, I love him. But yesterday was his 97th birthday, by the way. Yeah, 97. Um, he, he received a, a question in the mail. It asked, uh, why would a loving God send anyone to hell? 
I can't reconcile the idea of hell with Jesus' <coughs> teaching about love. I'm not sure I even believe in hell anyway. Maybe everyone will be saved, even if they weren't expecting it. Billy said, It may surprise you to discover that no one talked about hell or warned us against it more than Jesus. And we should take his words very seriously. He declared, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. What is hell? The Bible gives us several vivid images of hell, and without exception, they wouldn't make you want to go there. It calls it a place of darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It also says it's a place of absolute hopelessness, because God is totally absent from it, and those who go there will never experience heaven's joy and beauty and peace. The Bible says hell's inhabitants will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. But listen, God doesn't want us to go there. If we do, it will only be because of our stubborn desire to leave God out of our lives. God doesn't hate us. He loves us. And that is why he has provided a way for us to be forgiven of our sins and to go to be with him in heaven. That way is Christ who gave his life for us. Don't take hell lightly or talk yourself into believing it doesn't exist, for it does. Instead, turn to Jesus Christ and open your heart and your life to him today. Good answer from Billy Graham. And so I ask you, are you saved? Have you been born again so that you can avoid hell and enter into the kingdom of heaven? If not, what on earth are you waiting for? God's grace and forgiveness are free, and through them you can be free indeed. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Well, that's the truth, the truth that uh, Jesus came to tell us about and to save us from. And one day, if you just merely accept him and what he did for you, your eyes will see the glory that he's talked about. And this final hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, I think is a very fitting to follow that message and also to remember Veterans on Veterans Day. So uh, we'll finish with number 549, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
truth is marching on. Well, if you have not yet accepted Christ, what on earth are you waiting for? His grace is free, and through it, through him, you can be free indeed. We'll finish with shalom to you. See the glory. Shalom to you. Shalom, shalom, shalom.